We're in a series on the Old Testament prophets, and we're spending two weeks on each prophet, and uh, the, old, the major prophets, I should say. And uh, we're trying to help you get into some scripture you may not read often, and trying to help you understand it a bit. And one of the tools is called Bible Project, and you can go on YouTube and put Bible Project, and I think they've got all the books of the Bible done now, and you can get a quick overview of what's going on in that book, and uh, we hope that's a great resource that some of you have used also. So we're going to watch the very end of the Bible Project description of Isaiah, and it kind of gives you a big picture of some of the things we're going to be talking about this weekend. Let's watch this. Which brings us to the final section of the book, 56 to 66, where the servants inherit God's kingdom. These chapters are beautifully designed as a symmetry that brings together all of the themes of the book. At the very center are three beautiful poems that describe how the spirit-empowered servant is announcing the good news of God's kingdom to the poor, and he reaffirms all of the promises of hope from earlier in the book. The new Jerusalem, inhabited by God's servants, will be the place from which God's justice and mercy and blessing flow out to all the nations of the world. And surrounding these poems are two long prayers of repentance where the servants confess Israel's sin and they grieve over all of the evil they see in the world around them. And so they ask God to forgive them and that his kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. Now on each side of these prayers are collections of more poems that contrast the destiny of the servants with that of the wicked who persecute them. God says he's going to bring his justice on all who pollute his good world with their evil and selfishness and idolatry, and that he's going to remove them from his city forever. But the servants, those who are humble before God and who repent and own their evil, they are forgiven, and they will inherit the new Jerusalem, which, we discover, is an image for an entirely renewed creation, where death and suffering are gone forever. And this brings us to the very outer frame of this part of the book. In this renewed world of God's kingdom, people from all nations are invited to come and join the servants of God's covenant family so that everyone can know their creator and redeemer. And so the book of Isaiah ends with the very grand vision of the fulfillment of all of God's covenant promises. Through the suffering servant king, God creates a covenant family of all nations who are awaiting the hope of God's justice and bringing a renewed creation, where God's kingdom finally comes here on earth as it is in heaven. And that's the very powerful hope of the book of Isaiah. Years ago when my youngest daughter was about second grade, I think it was, Evidently, she had talked to some friends at school whose parents were getting a divorce, and she was very concerned about all of that. And so she came home, and she asked me, and she and I were just sitting in the room by ourselves, and she said, are you going to ever divorce, Mom? That's a pretty uh, strong and pointed question, and obviously she had a lot writing on it. And I said, no, honey, your mom and I are never going to get a divorce. And she said, do you promise me? (laughs) And you know, I stood in front of God and 400 witnesses and gave a bow to my wife, but it was nothing compared to this promise I had to make to a second grader. (laughs) And in a flash, I got a picture of what it would like if I destroyed her life by divorcing her mom. And I thought, this is a big deal. And I think that's a great picture for you and I, because if there's anything that's clear about the scriptures, it's that we are connected to a promise-giving, promise-keeping God. That's good. If you feel like just you can't help but say amen or agree, preach it, brother, whatever you need to do, just, it's all right. <laughs> I've probably opened Pandora's box now. (laughs) But God is a promise-giving, promise-keeping God, and you read it all the way through the Scriptures. And so I have a goal for us today. One is I hope to teach you a little bit about how Bible prophecy works, and hopefully that'll be a little educational part of this. But I also hope to challenge your heart to be living for the promises that God has given that He has still not kept yet 
and we live in anticipation and excitement for that. Because the, the prophets that we've been talking about, we've been talking a lot about judgment and repentance, and all the way through these prophets, God is calling His people to account. You were supposed to be following me. You were supposed to be kind to the poor. You were supposed to be just in your dealings. And He keeps calling them to, to recognize their sin and to repent, to come back. And of course, as they, the majority of them don't. And so then he keeps telling them punishment is coming, judgment is coming, and eventually they are hauled away into exile. But there's also two other themes. I don't know if you've noticed them all woven through this, and that is that God is going to someday send a Messiah. There's going to be a person who comes, who is the son who will set his people free. And then he also gives us, especially in the book of Isaiah, some small glimpses of when he makes everything new, the restoration at the end of time. And those things are to give us hope and encouragement. So God promises all the way through, and we, if you just to review, we are right here in about 700 years, 740 years before Christ, just before the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel. And God is making these promises to Israel so that they will live in hope in spite of the sin and judgment and difficulties, and in fact, in spite of the fact that some days it doesn't look like it's going to happen. And he's giving them promises to hold on to. And the Savior who was to come, and the word Messiah in the Hebrew is the word for the anointed one, and in the New Testament, in the Greek, it is the word Christ. So when you say Jesus Christ, you're saying Jesus, that was his personal name that his buddies would have called him when he ran around Nazareth. And then Christ is the title, that he was the one who was the anointed one to come. So all the way through Isaiah, he promises the Messiah. But there are different pictures of the Messiah, which is part of why it's confusing. He also is talking about when there will be a restored and peaceful and godly nation, that in fact, Jerusalem will be the place where the the leading and the, the governorship of the whole world will come from that. And so they were anticipating that there would be a Messiah coming soon, and they assumed that he would set everything right at that time. So what you need to know about prophecy is that prophecy is complicated. Now, now let me say beforehand, prophecy is critically important. God used prophecy to give people hope when it looked like everything was failing. It is what is to give us hope when it looks like our world is spiraling. It is to be the focus. In fact, somebody said, you know the difference between somebody who believes in God's promises and somebody who doesn't? One's an optimist and one's a pessimist because God will eventually work things out even though it doesn't always look like it. So, but even though prophecy is important, it's complicated And I was thinking about this theme of God making and keeping promises. And not only does he use it to give us hope, he uses it to develop our hearts. If you look at the story of Abraham, God promised that he would be a great nation and he had no children. And from that point until the time when he had finally the son that was promised, it was 25 years. Why make him wait that long? What's the point of this? And I think you also see that theme that as we wait for the promises of God, it develops who we are. It develops faith. It develops us. So prophecy is complicated, and I want to give you some visual pictures so that you can understand that. But here's an encouragement even from the New Testament that said even the guys in writing the Bible didn't have it all figured out. So it says, concerning this salvation, the prophets, particularly Isaiah we're looking at, who spoke of the grace that was to come, searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the suffering of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. What that tells me is when Isaiah was writing this, he didn't have it all figured out himself in terms of the timeline. He knew that it was all going to happen, And in fact, it helps, I think, to have a picture of visually how this works. So when you look at a range of mountains, it's easy to think that those peaks look right next to each other. 
And in reality, as you stand here, there's this first line that is immediately in your foreground. And when Isaiah is giving these prophecies, some of them are for the people of his day. That Isaiah was not written to you and me first off, it was written to the people who lived 700 years before Jesus. And so some of those things were fulfilled at that point. And then there are some of those that are in the the ways down the road that were about Jesus coming the first time. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled over 40 very clear, specific prophecies that only could have been fulfilled by Jesus. It's part of the importance of prophecy is that it says, this is a God book, not a man book. Amen. That he does what he, he tells us what's going to happen sometimes thousands of years beforehand. And it happens. So there are some things that Jesus fulfilled in his first coming. There are, however, some things sometimes mixed in with those that didn't happen when he came the first time. And so those are for the far distance. And I don't know if you've ever done this hiking where you think you're going to go from one peak to the next. Hunters, uh, you may have experienced this. Well, I'll meet you on the next ridge. And it doesn't look like it's that far till you get on the top of the ridge and you have to go all the way down to the bottom and all the way back up. And I believe that, that the prophets, even in the New Testament, were a little bit surprised that things didn't happen faster than they did, that, than they should or that they wanted them to. And I think the, the truth is, is God's timing is always different than yours and mine. But he is the one that has it set correctly. So it's a little helpful when we look at prophecy to say, which mountain range are we talking about? And I have a perfect example from the book of Isaiah in chapter 7. So we read, first of all, the Christmas verse. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Is that clearly about Jesus or what? Right? You see that on Christmas cards. You see that's an exciting verse and Emmanuel means God with us. And here's another proof of Jesus. My question is, have you read the whole chapter? Because there's a lot more going on than you may have seen to start with. It's always important to get context. So we back back to the context around Isaiah's immediate day, and here it is. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, so the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. I was sharing that with somebody this week, and they said, wow, that's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of names in there, a lot of things going on. This is the context for this prophecy. And it's actually fairly simple if you boil it down to the basics. It says there's a king named Rezim who's running this country, Aram. There's a king named Pekah who is in charge of the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom. And they had allied themselves together, and they were coming down to attack Judah. And Ahaz was the king of Judah down here. And so they'd come, and they tried to attack at one time, and they were repulsed, but they were scared to death because these two powerful enemies had said, we're going to conquer Judah, we're going to divide it up, tear it apart, and we'll divide it. You can have half, and I'll have half. So you can imagine that this small country down here being attacked by two large countries is terrified. And so God sends a message to Isaiah. You see, sometimes if we're not careful, we think that all their job was is to write things for thousands of years in the future. They were actually prophets at the time. And they spoke for God and people asked them questions to find out from God. And so Isaiah goes to Ahaz, the king of Judah, and he says... Here's a message of peace for you. Those two kings you're worried about, not going to happen. They are not going to overcome you. They are not, I'm going to protect you. Isaiah also tells him that eventually Assyria is going to come and take them over. But right now, those two guys you're worried about, don't worry about them anymore. And so Isaiah says, 
Ahaz, ask the Lord for a sign, and we will give you a sign. God will give you a sign. And Ahaz, who was not a godly king, somehow gets sanctimonious and says, well, I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. So, God himself chooses a sign. He says, and I will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and bear a child, and you will, he will be called Emmanuel. And then look at the verses afterwards. He says, he will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. So what is Isaiah 14 about? The first range of mountains is it was about a prophecy to Ahaz that said, those two kings that you're worried about, they're not going to overwhelm you, and I will give you a sign. There will be a child that will be born in your time. Some people think it might have been Isaiah's wife. Some people think it might have been a woman in the court there. But somebody that they knew, this child is going to be born, and before it's old enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, I don't know, two years old, three years old, whatever age they would have set, within a couple of years, these two guys, they're going to be gone. These two smoldering firebrands, he calls them. And in fact, we know from the scriptures that those two kings were never able to conquer Judah. And in fact, one of them was assassinated. So that's the first level of that prediction. So you think, well, why do we use it for talking about Jesus then? Well, it's clearly also a foreshadowing, we call it, a picture of the Messiah that was to come. And we know that for sure because it's quoted in Matthew. And that's the clear way you have of knowing that it's a, it's a prediction that was fulfilled. So then we have a problem. You say, wait a minute, were there two virgins then? Was the virgin birth in Isaiah's day, is that sort of somehow detract from the virgin birth of Christ? And it's an interesting thing that most people don't know about the language, that the Hebrew in which Isaiah was written, the word virgin is actually Alma, which can mean young woman. She can be unmarried, she can be married, she can be sexually inexperienced, she can be someone who is, is a married woman that has uh, had children already. It just means young woman. And so it's very clear and easy for us to see how that part of the prophecy could have simply referred to a woman in the court of Ahaz. But when it is translated in the New Testament, which comes from the, the, the Hebrews of Jesus' day, had many of them quit learning Hebrew. The popular language was Greek, and so about 200 years before Christ, the Old Testament had been all translated into Greek, which your vocab word on your outline there says the Septuagint. So if you ever hear of the Septuagint, that is a Greek version of the Old Testament. And when they translated Isaiah 7 into the Septuagint, they used the word Parthenos. It says the virgin, and that word means the same thing the English word virgin means. And we know specifically that when it gets to Matthew 1, he, he reinforces it, and he said, which means God with us. So does that detract at all from the virgin birth of Christ? Absolutely not, because the prophecy fits both scenarios with that. And in the New Testament, we know that Mary said, how is this going to be since I do not know a man? So she knew she was a virgin. And Joseph was really sure that it was not his child. Remember, he was going to divorce her quietly. And in fact, when he decides to divorce her, God sends an angel in a dream. And the angel says to him this right here. This was not just Mary's word. This isn't just the Greek word in the New Testament. This is, in fact, a fulfillment of a prophecy. So you think, okay, so it was fulfilled in Isaiah's day. It was clearly filled in Christ as well. So you see those two levels of mountains in that verse. And then if we go over to uh, the next level in chapter uh, 9 of Isaiah... Isaiah continues to talk about this child that will be born and the suffering servant. And sometimes you're not quite sure who he's talking about. 
But in Isaiah 9, another Christmas passage, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. Who does that have to be about? Yeah, he's called the Everlasting God, he's, or the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and it says that the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Clearly, in Jerusalem, the, that peace came to an end. And then it says, he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time, whatever that time is, on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So, interwoven into the pictures that Isaiah had of the future was a picture of a suffering servant and a picture of a conquering king. Now, they weren't sure exactly how to distinguish that. And the only reason we can distinguish it is because we know what Jesus did the first time he came, and we can therefore logically assume that the rest of the prophecies are for when he comes the second time, which is what he also promised. For example, Isaiah 11, and I, and I hope this resonates in your heart. Let me just read this to you. And the wolf will lo- live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat, and the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them, and the cow will feed with the bear, and their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and the infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest, and they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You know, I, I don't know about you, but every time I read that, there's something in me that goes, yes! <laughs> Won't it be awesome when things are set right? That when Jesus says, I am making everything new, there's something in us that says, I wish I didn't have to lock my house. I wish I didn't have to worry about violence. I I wish I didn't have to struggle with the resentment that's inside of me. I wish the world were right. And when it's not right, it bothers us. And, And God gives these hopeful glimpses that says someday, that desire you have, for things to be really perfect. I'm going to do that. And nobody but God could do that. And part of the reason for these glimpses, I think, is it also gives us a reminder, the world we're in is not that world. You see that picture of a child reaching into a viper's nest, and you're thinking, that doesn't feel good at all. But this idea that the violence is gone, that the wars are gone, that injustice is gone. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if, even if everybody just had to tell the truth in court? (laughs) Wouldn't it be amazing if everybody had to tell the truth in politics? Wouldn't Wouldn't it be amazing if anybody told the truth? Right? And he goes on to say, someday, those desires that you have are going to be fulfilled. So, the reason prophecy is complicated is because there are various levels at which God is keeping His promises. But God is always going to keep His promises. But you can understand that when Jesus rode in on a donkey and they were putting palm branches in His path, what did they expect? They thought, here comes the Messiah that's going to kick out the Romans, that's going to bring the peaceable kingdom, and Jerusalem will be the center of the world and we will rule the world from here. Which is why the disciples kept saying, who gets to sit at your right hand and your left and who's going to have the best positions? They were jockeying for power in a kingdom they thought was coming immediately. And it didn't happen the way that they thought. This, not only was the timeline difficult, but these two different descriptions of the Messiah were interwoven in such a way that, frankly, I I think if you read it now, you're thinking, I'm not sure I would have figured that out. In fact, if you have to choose between a conquering king and a suffering servant, what are, you going to, what are you going to bid for? It's like, I want the conquering king. I want immediate. 
And, and so the two pictures were, there's going to be coming a conquering king who will destroy all, not only the enemies, but all wickedness. And he will then bring this kind of lasting peace. But then there is also, especially in the book of Isaiah, a clear picture that there's going to be a suffering servant that comes and is destroyed, is beat up, is pierced. And here's what they didn't understand that we now understand. That before the world could be made right, death and sin had to be conquered. That before the conquering king would come, the suffering servant came to give his life as a ransom for you and me. And that that had to come in order. And I think most of them would be very surprised at how long it's been between. Because the expectation is that just as Jesus came the first time, he would come again and they thought it would be rapidly. But in Isaiah 53, we see this picture of the suffering servant. And, and I hope that this touches your heart because this is the God that gave his life so that you and I could have life. He became poor so that we could become rich. It says, surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. And as soon as we hear that, we think of crucifixion, which is ironic in the sense that 700 years before Christ, crucifixion wasn't even practiced. It says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was laid on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. As you read through Isaiah 53 this, this week, let me encourage you to take out us and we and to put your name there. That he's turned it, that I have gone astray and I have turned to my own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of Paul. You see, it becomes extremely personal when you realize before the peace can come outside, the peace has to come inside. And that I'm desperately, I, I'm in need of the saving grace of Jesus every day. I challenged you last week to preach yourself the gospel every day, that we acknowledge how sinful we really are, that the resentment and the lust and the greed and the envy and the criticism of others, all of that wells up inside of us all the time. Sin isn't something you do once in a while. It's something you can never get out completely out of as long as we still have the old nature in our, in our fleshly bodies. But the Holy Spirit inside of us is also changing us and renewing us and giving us a mind to be more like Christ. And so, as you identify with that, as you identify with understanding why Christ had to come that way, then you realize that all God's promises are going to come true. You see, when Jesus was ready to go back to heaven after the resurrection, it says he was out on the Mount of Olives and it says that as he was talking to his disciples, he was taken up out of, his, out of their sight. And then there was an angel. As they're standing there waiting for him, I think, to come back down right then, he comes and he says, he will come in the same way that he went. Amen. And when I visit Israel, we always look at the Mount of Olives. And uh, there's also a prophecy in Zechariah 14 that says, that when the Son of Man comes, his feet will be on the Mount of Olives. He's actually going to split the mountain in two. And when you're sitting there looking at that, you think, wow, it's going to be right here. You see, because 2 Peter 1 says, we have the word of the prophets made more sure. What that means is that we can see a whole lot of things, not because we're smarter than Isaiah. We just have a whole lot of years in, in retrospect to look back, and we can see, oh, that happened. And here's what Jesus did on his first visit. And just as clearly, Jesus promised that he was going to come again. Now, somebody asked me, why don't we talk about prophecy more? And... Um, 
and I think it's a good challenge. We probably need to talk about prophecy more. But, but the answer in my heart is when people get into prophecy, I'm afraid for many people it becomes a hobby. And you know what? It becomes a hobby so they can argue with other people. And I read The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey in 1970-something. And he told us exactly how it was all going to be fulfilled. And he was wrong. And I've seen groups sell all their stuff and go up on the hill and wait for Christ's return or put billboards up all the way down to I-5. And when people get focused like that on trying to fit the daily events into exactly how prophecy is going to be fulfilled, then when it doesn't happen, it looks to some people like it's discrediting God. And we are so self-centered, we always want it to be about me. And some people, they study prophecy so they can see how everything is going to work out for me. And it doesn't make them more passionate for God, and it doesn't make them witness to their neighbors, and it doesn't give them a passion to live as though Jesus could come any moment. And see, I asked myself the question, why did Jesus tell the disciples, I'm coming back, in such a way that they were expecting him any day? When he knew it was going to be 2,000 years at least. And you know, I think there's a very important answer to that. I think one of the purposes of prophecy is to cause us to live in anticipation all the time. From the time of the disciples, for the last 2,000 years, every generation of Christians was supposed to think, could be right now. You see, because it helps us not get caught up in the world. It helps us to live for eternity. (laughs) Maybe it helps you think to yourself, do I want Jesus catching me doing this when I'm, uh, if he's coming back immediately? And it's good to look at prophecy in light of history. Just don't try to get it too matched up because Jesus said that his coming will be like the birth pangs of a, of a woman giving childbirth, in childbirth. And uh, when you are in labor, I, I love this term, they say you're going to feel some intense pressure. <laughs> is that how you describe it, ladies? Is that, is that a good word? So, So there are times in history when there's intense pressure, and it looks like, I mean, think about it, 1941, the Third Reich, the Germans are taking over, they're walking all the way through, they're targeting the Jewish people for destruction, and it looks like the whole world is going to be destroyed. Would you have thought that would have been a time when Jesus was about to come back? If you were living in that day, you'd have been praying for it, let me tell you. So... The point is there are times that it looked like, oh, it's going to be this way, and then it changes. It kind of backs off a little bit. In fact, in our experience, there were times when Jan was in labor, and then it's like, it's here we go, and then it quits. <laughs> and you are left to wait. And I, I think that's a perfect picture for how prophecy works. Number one, it's supposed to make us live in anticipation, that we live with eternity in mind instead of our daily life. And it it makes us want to reach our neighbors instead of be complacent. Secondly, I I think that prophecy also helps us to have hope when times get hard. When you and I look at the world and we see the sin rolling in, and as Isaiah said, they're calling evil good and good evil. Instead of getting pessimistic and weighed down and depressed and wringing our hands about how the world is, There's this confidence that God is going to set things right someday. And he is working now, and we are his agents. We are the resistance working against the flow of, of what Satan is doing. And then thirdly, I think it's supposed to be so that we recognize it as it's coming. That when Jesus' first coming happened, they had enough information, they should have acknowledged him. They should have been ready, and they didn't do that, most of them. So, the truth about God's promises is that they are not always what we want, but they are always what we need. And they're not always in our timing, but they are always in God's timing. And so I hope that that gives you a little clarity as you read your own Bible to understand how prophecy is interwoven. But more than that, I hope that it challenges you. And you think, you know, I don't think about Jesus coming back very often. I don't spend much time thinking about 
heaven. I don't spend much time thinking about investing in the kingdom of God. And I think it's kind of funny. Have you ever tried to talk to 20-year-olds about putting money aside for retirement? It's like, you're serious with all the other things we could spend it on? But, it, but at my age, it's becoming a little more irrelevant. Why? Because it's more imminent. And I think that also affects our relationship with Christ. If you think it's way out in the future, it's not very urgent, it's not very much on our minds, not very much on our schedules. If you get more urgent about it, if it becomes more imminent, then you begin saying, God, help me to live today as a light for your kingdom going out so that people will come to find and follow Jesus. And I want to be one of those people that's helping people find and follow Jesus. So I hope this is more than head knowledge about how prophecy works. I hope it stirs your heart up and says, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I want to live with anticipation and readiness, and I want to be caught serving you with all my heart when you come. I'm going to hand off to uh, Green Campus, actually, uh, because uh, the South County is actually meeting in the, they're having a festival in the park, and they're having a church service in the park uh, down in Myrtle Creek. So we hand off to you guys. Love you both. Let me ask you two questions. How has the first coming of Jesus affected you? And I hope that as you read the Old Testament, you understand that Jesus is the only possible answer to the sin problem that we all have, that nobody else could fit the bill of the Messiah, that He has to be the one. And I, I sincerely hope that everybody here has come to the place where you've committed your life to Christ and you've said, I am a follower of Jesus first of all before anything else. That that first coming has changed not only your future destiny but your life. And then the second question is are you living in anticipation? I mean, honestly, think back over the last month. Have you thought about Jesus coming back? Have you thought about heaven? Have you thought about investing? Have you, have you thought about what's real and eternal? Or have you been so caught in today that you forget about the things that really matter? And I hope by elevating this that you go around with the mindset of Jesus might come again. You know, every time there's a cool... Uh, Sunset where there's that light streams through and you think, boy, those look like resurrection rapture clouds. I'm ready. <laughs> I hope that there's that trigger in your mind that says life is short. Life here is temporary. But God has given us the privilege of extracting what we can never hang on to and investing it into what we will never lose. And so I hope it stirs us up to say, let's live not for the temporary, but for the permanent. Father, thank you for the prophecy, the words that you've given to us in the past. And thank you that we have the words of the prophet made more sure. And that in fact, you fulfilled your word in Isaiah's day and you fulfilled your word by sending Jesus. And you will fulfill your word by sending Jesus again. And Father, give us, as we read the Scriptures, as we look at our world, give us that sense of anticipation and joy and urgency about your coming so that we might be stirred up not to argue with each other about prophecy charts, but to God live lives that are holy, expectantly waiting for the King. In Jesus, your wonderful name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.